Hello everyone and welcome to our session. Today we're going to be tackling solving client conundrums using QuickBooks Online. My name is Tanis and it is an honor and a privilege to connect with all of you at our session. My bookkeeping practice is called Maven Bookkeeping and my team and I happily serve a variety of clients across Western Canada. And I'll give you a little insight into who I was before. I grew up on a farm but my entire life, I wanted to live close to the mountains and that dream became a reality in the fall of 2000. I'm a certified pro advisor and a very proud member of the Intuit Trainer Writer Network. I'm very passionate about educating accounting professionals and small business owners. My other source of happiness, of course, usually involves my road bike, a quiet paved secondary road and a sunny day. And of course, don't forget about that slight tailwind. Here's a sneak peek at what we'll be tackling in our session. I hope you enjoy digging a little deeper into QuickBooks Online by looking through the lens of five small business owners. Whether you're an accounting professional or a small business owner or both, we'll look at finding solutions to a few complex problems. First off, let me welcome you students all over the world. We're going to take a moment to return back to school at the Curious Clicker Academy. But just so you know, this isn't any ordinary school. This is a school where you're going to stretch your brain and have a little bit of fun at the same time. We're going to use our very best problem solving skills to find a solution to five conundrums, all while using QuickBooks Online. So welcome to Curious Clicker Academy where just because curiosity killed the cat doesn't mean that your mouse is broken. In our class, we're going to be hearing from five small business owners who have a conundrum for us to solve. First, we're going to swim over to Sailor Knot. She owns a store at the local marina that sells products to her clients that of course love to sail. Second, we will giddy up and meet Annie Oaktree. Annie is an Alberta cowgirl that has a team of seasonal contractors that help her train horses. Third, we'll chat over the fence with Peter Pickett. Peter owns a small construction company that specializes in, of course, building fences. Fourth, we'll dust off our shoes to connect with Alice Bunch. After retiring from working for a family with six children, can you imagine, Alice has started her own residential cleaning company. And last, we'll cook up a time to chat with Ginger B. House. Ginger owns a bakery that specializes in macaroons. Let's get started, shall we? Our first conundrum today comes from Sailor Knot. Sailor has a question regarding inventory in QuickBooks Online. Let's see what she has on her mind and hopefully we can provide some insight that will solve her conundrum. Every spring, Sailor purchases boatloads of products to sell in her store at the marina. But when summer is over, she usually sells her remaining inventory at a discount. But at the moment, Sailor is manually changing the price of each item on every single invoice that's created. She's found the process to be quite challenging while attempting to wrap up the summer season. There must be a better way. Our solution is a feature called Price Rules. Let's unpack how to best utilize this feature in QuickBooks Online. First, let's start by looking at these five steps. But keep in mind that step number two and number three are optional, and you can perform them before or after turning on price rules. The first step in the process is to enable price rules. Keep in mind that price rules are only available in QBO Plus, which is the highest level of subscription. From the gear icon, choose Account and Settings, then choose Sales. Find the submenu called Products and Services and toggle the price rules on. Don't forget to click Save and then Done. Once enabled, you can access the price rules in two different places, which is very common in QuickBooks Online. First, in the upper left corner, you can access price rules by clicking on the gear, all lists, and then price rules. Instead, you have the option of landing in the sales center by using the left navigation bar. So either option is going to work depending on your preference. 
The second step is to create customer types. Now from the customer center, this is where you can actually create the customer types. Just look for the button just above the money bar. Remember that this feature is only available in QuickBooks Online Plus. Using customer types can be very useful when assigning price rules to your different customer groups. They can also help you keep track of different types of customers in the customer center and allow you to create filtered customer contact list reports. So even though we're focusing on price rules in our session, this particular function of using customer types can be used in a variety of other ways. The third step is to batch assign customer types to your customer list. And the most direct way to accomplish this is to put a check mark in the box beside every single customer you want to assign. Then from the batch actions dropdown, choose select customer type. Choose your desired customer type from the dropdown and then click apply. And voila, all of your customers have been assigned a particular customer type. The fourth step is to return to the price rules dashboard. So notice on our screen that there are two different images. The screenshot on the left shows the price rule center before you create a rule. The screenshot on the right, lower side, creates, shows the center after you create your first rule. In the lower right corner, notice that under the actions column, you now have two options, edit and make an active. Continuing on with step four, we begin the process of setting up a price rule in anticipation of selling off inventory at the end of the season, because remember that was Sailor's initial ask. The create a price rule screen makes it easy to assign special pricing to customers and products and service items. But the good news is that there's no limit on the number of price rules that you can create in QuickBooks Online. Let's go through all the components of a price rule we start by looking for create a rule if it's your first rule or new price rule if it's not. When creating a price rule, it's best to follow these steps to ensure success. We begin by selecting the start and end date. We choose the start and end date to set the duration that the rule should actively, actively be active. These rules are optional and be, can be used independently from one another. Just keep in mind that if you leave it blank, the price rule is going to remain in effect indefinitely. And this is important to remember. And this is also why we start with selecting the date range. Then we move on to selecting our customers. From the drop down list, you can select the customers to which the rule should be applied. You have an option of selecting individually, or you can choose all customers, or you can filter by customer type. Next, we select the product and service to apply the price rule to. Again, you can select each item individually or by type. Now we need to choose our price adjustment method. So this might require a little bit of thought ahead of time. You can set the sales price by percentage, fixed amount, or custom price per item. Again, the flexibility depends on your personal preferences in your particular situation. You can choose whether to increase or decrease the base price amount and enter the value as either a percentage or a fixed amount. If you select the custom price per item method, you will need to enter a price for each product or service item selected. So keep this in mind just in case you've got many, many products to make changes to. This will ultimately take quite a bit longer if you have to set up a price rule for every single item. There are a number of other options there, so feel free to take a look and do some experimenting. So congratulations, you've just created your first price rule. But guess what? There's more. If multi-currency is enabled in the company, you can choose to have the price rule apply only to a certain currency or to all currencies. And this is gonna be a great extra feature for those of you that have been struggling with uh, inventory items that are in US dollars. So this means that if you combine a custom price rule for a foreign currency such as US dollars and the product and service item, you can set a custom US dollar selling price for your various items. 
So when you sell to US customers, the US price will not fluctuate with the exchange price. Isn't that brilliant? Now, when you review the setup of a product or service item, notice what now appears near the bottom. The foreign currency price rule will appear in each item record to which it is applied. So keep that in mind the next time you're solving a problem, just like sailors. In our final and fifth step, sailor can now easily sell her stock to her customers at the end of the summer. You can begin by using an estimate, an invoice, or a sales receipt, just exactly the way you would have normally done in the past. When you're entering a product or service in the sales transaction, the price rule will automatically be applied. You can also override the price rule by selecting the rule you want to use from the drop-down list. So if the customer or item combination selected is eligible for more than one price rule, the default sales rate for that item will be displayed with an indicator next to the rate field that says there are multiple price rules that apply to this product or customer. And to resolve this, simply use the drop down on the rate field and select which rule you want to use or simply just enter a different rate. I hope that this will help accounting professionals and small business owners like yourselves tackle end of season inventory sales. Price rules are a relatively new feature in QuickBooks Online, and there's many businesses that could benefit from using this feature. Now let's move on and meet our Alberta cowgirl, Annie Oaktree. Spring is on the way, which means that all of Annie's customers would like their horses trained for the upcoming rodeo circuit. She's noticed that she doesn't have enough hours in the day to provide all the training and would like to hire a subcontractor. Annie did check with her accountant to confirm that they can be hired as subcontractors and not employees. We're going to use this particular scenario to tackle the area of T4As and T5018s now available in QuickBooks Online. Let's go check it out. To begin, let's look at the supplier information fields. What's new is the additional boxes on the lower right side of the form, and maybe you've noticed them before, maybe you haven't. So depending on what you need, choose T4A or T5018 from the box that says Track 4 in the drop-down menu. Next, we enter the business ID number or the social insurance number. Just make sure you don't have any spaces. Then you would finish off by selecting that this supplier is either an individual or a business. These, file, these fields generally must be completed in order to easily move on to the next steps. But if you happen to miss collecting some of the information, don't worry, QuickBooks Online will of course remind you later. Next, it's time to mark our suppliers in a batch using the Batch Actions drop-down menu. So there's no need to open each supplier individually unless you know that their profile isn't complete. Again, if you're missing information, don't worry, QBO will definitely remind you later when we start preparing those actual tax slips. Now that you've taken the steps of identifying suppliers as needing a T4A or T5018, there are some new reports waiting for you in the Report Center. If you scroll down to the section called Expenses and Suppliers, you'll notice four reports. Two are for the T4A and two are for the T5018. And the good news is that there's no need to create custom reports anymore, or at least that's what I had to do. Add these reports to your year-end checklist to ensure you have all the information you need before filing the tax slips. Here's a closer look at the two T4A reports. It's really important to note that the T4A reports do not include sales tax. The report splits it out so it's obvious what is actually reported in box 48. It's also very important to note is that the date next to the bill is not the bill date, but it's actually when the bill was paid. This is because reporting is done on a cash basis. So if there's any unpaid bills in the report, in your accounts uh, payable report, they will not be included in this particular version. The same thing is going to happen when we look at the two reports related to T5018s. In this case, the T5018 reports do include sales tax and are completely reported in box 22 of the slip. 
Again, just like our T4As, the date next to bill is not the date of the actual bill itself. It's actually when the bill was paid because remember, we are again reporting on a cash basis. If there's any unpaid bills in that period, it's not included. Now comes the fun part. It's time to prepare the tax slips. Start by heading to the supplier center and review the column that says tax slips and enter any information in the supplier record. The easiest way to spot those is simply just to look for the orange warning symbol. Once you've dealt with all the warnings, click on prepare tax slips. That button is located in the top right corner. If you haven't filed either of these slips in the past, here's the deadlines that you need to be aware of. First, the T4A slip is due by the end of February. It has the exact same deadline as our normal T4s and T5s. Your T5018 slips are due no later than six months after your fiscal or calendar year end. And I remember this taking me by surprise when I had my very first construction client. Click Let's Get Started and now QuickBooks will walk you through the interview to get your tax slips prepared. Depending on what your scenario is, select either T4A or T5018 from the drop down menu. And in Annie's case, she would be selecting the T4A. If you choose the T4A, QBO will automatically select the date range to be the calendar year. So some of the heavy lifting is going to be done for you. If, however, you choose the T5018, you can choose either the past calendar year or past fiscal year. Just remember to keep it consistent with what you've done in the past. But for today's example, we are going to look on how to file the T4A as per Annie's requirements. In our next step, we're going to be required to verify or enter any information regarding the company. If you're filing a T4A, the account will be pointing to your RP0001 account, for example, and that's payroll. If you're filing a T5018 form, you'll be recording the information that will populate in your RZ0001 account. You can use the back button anytime you want to to return to a previous screen. So there's no need to worry about getting it right the first time. And I remember the first time I used this feature that I zipped back and forth several times as I wrapped my head around what information I was being asked for. So take your time and don't forget to be a curious clicker. QBO will prompt you to double check the contractor information. If information is missing, hover over the name to view what's missing and then look at how QBO will assist you in addressing the problem. This dialog box is going to pop up with a handy little link called Update the Supplier. Click on the link, make the necessary changes, and then click the back button on your browser to return to this screen. If you happen to leave the interview at any point, it will pick up where you left off. And literally, the interview process will guide you through all the steps to the very end. The good news is that you're almost done. You can now save the PDF to download your tax slips and then print and distribute them for your contractors. We do not have the ability to email the forms directly from QuickBooks Online. If you're interested in electronically filing these slips with the government, please remember to click the download XML button. I found this process to have a very similar feeling to filing the T4s in QuickBooks Payroll. Make sure you make note of where the file was downloaded. I find that my computer often defaults to the main downloads folder, but your computer might do something different. If you're ready, click e-file e now and a new tab will open. You'll be redirected to the CRA website. It's at this screen that you'll complete the steps to submit the file. Make sure you've got the business number handy as well as the transmitter number. Now the transmitter number simply can be used by entering 555555, that's our default. Upload the XML file, save your confirmation, return to QBO, and voila, your QBO um, process of filing your T4A or T5018 slips is officially done. I hope that you found this lesson in issuing T4As and T5018s, great information to help you make that task a lot less time consuming for you in the years ahead.
Now let's go meet Peter Pickett. He's a busy getting ready to tackle all the fences that he's got lined up for this summer. So it does look like summer is going to be really busy again for Peter and his company, Pickpocket Fencing. Peter shared with me that he was quite unprepared last year. Many customer orders, money flying around all over the place, and at the end of the season, he had a really hard time remembering who gave him a deposit and who didn't. To help with cash flow this year, Peter would like to ask his customers to pay a deposit up front. It's a great question and can be applied across a number of different types of businesses. All three options that we're going to look at today are feasible, but we need to take into account some additional information before rec making a recommendation to Peter. Now you might call this deposit a retainer, a prepayment, or a down payment, but essentially we're talking about all the same things. There are a few considerations that you need to take into account before you choose the best method for you, you your business, or your client. First, do you have to issue any financial statements to outside parties? Consider how long the retainer will actually be kept on your books and also think about how large the deposits are. So let's walk through those three options together now. Option number one is called the deposit feature. We can activate this feature in QuickBooks Online through the big gear, account and settings, sales, and then sales form content. This feature allows deposits to be recorded in the same form as the actual sales transaction. So this means that the deposit will be dated the same date as that invoice that you sent to your customer. Toggle the button from gray to green, save and done. Here's what you'll see when you create that first invoice in QuickBooks Online if you've chosen to use option number one. You would start off in the normal fashion and create an invoice and enter in all the income lines of the product or services that you're selling. Next, in, as we scroll down to the lower right corner, we would enter the amount in the deposit field. After we've entered the deposit, zip back up to the header and now fill in where that money will be deposited. Now you have a choice. If it's only going to be that one deposit going in the bank on one day, you can choose the appropriate bank account. If you plan on grouping it together with other deposits, other customer uh, prepayments, make sure you choose undeposited funds. In the background, the normal transaction is a credit to both our income and our sales tax payable. And the debit would either be to undeposited funds or your bank account of choice. Remember that we're recording revenue even though it's not been earned. That's the accrual method of accounting. But by using this method, it is not easy to create a report of retainers that you currently have on hand. So consider using this option only if you accept retainers occasionally. There is very little time between the retainer received and the actual invoice being created, or if the deposit is non-refundable. Let's take a look now at option number two. Option number two is the most straightforward solution because it doesn't require any setup at all. To account for a deposit not recorded as income, we would use the template called receive payment to enter the deposit. But the trick is that we won't need to apply that deposit to any outstanding customer invoice. What we do suggest if you want to choose option number two is in your big gear account and settings advanced and automation, you might want to consider turning off the feature that would automatically apply customer payments to the oldest invoice for that customer. When the job is complete, you can create the customer invoice, but don't forget to apply that deposit that you've already received and then issue the invoice to the customer. The tricky part with this option is that at the end of the year, so if your transactions tend to cross over a year end, we don't want any negative amount sitting on accounts receivable. Simply create a journal entry to move them out of accounts receivable into a liability account, and then just don't forget to reverse it again the first day of the next fiscal year. When to use this option, think about uh, what clients might be best suited 
depending on their comfortable uh, nature with QuickBooks Online. Maybe the, the amount isn't that material, or maybe sales tax is not really an issue within the client's province. Just a couple things to keep in mind. Option number three, and our final option, requires the most setup and management, but don't let the extra work scare you away from implementing this method. This method involves creating a liability account, an item that points to the liability account, and then ongoing reconciliation of your new liability account. That's a lot of information, but I'm gonna break it down for you. We would create a sales receipt or an invoice the way we normally do, and we will use the product or service that we've just created. So let's take a look at what that looks like. A picture really is worth a thousand words. So here is an example of setting up a product or service and we'll give it the name called Retainer. At the same time, in the Income Account dropdown, we can create our new liability account called Client Retainers. The trick here is to make sure you choose the tax code called out of scope. Because remember, when we take a retainer up front, that is considered unearned or deferred revenue. So we don't want this particular retainer landing on our sales tax returns quite yet. After the initial setup is complete, we can move on to creating an invoice or a sales receipt to collect the actual retainer from our customer. Don't forget to use out of scope tax. And just a reminder, the reason we do that is because this retainer will not be counted as revenue until the job is invoiced or completed. The retainer can be broken down and applied against multiple invoices in the future if desired. So just because you collect a $10,000 retainer doesn't mean that you have to reduce your first invoice by the full amount of the retainer. You might have a different arrangement with your customer. When you create your invoice, the first line would contain all of the different products and services that you're invoicing your customer for based on the project or job. The last line is going to remove the original amount that you recorded as that retainer. Don't forget to put it in as a negative amount. Also note that all of the items used to record sales will have its appropriate tax code applied to it. But when it comes to recording or deducting that retainer off of this invoice, please remember to use out of scope tax. Now this step is very, very important. When reconciling control accounts like retainers, the ending balance should be zero, and then you would simply leave unused items unchecked. Think of this account kind of like a clearing account. You would select reconcile from the accounting menu on the left navigation bar, start a normal reconciliation for this liability account, the beginning balance is zero, and the ending balance is zero. Now I typically reconcile these accounts at year end, but depending on the volume of activity, you might want to be reconciling this on maybe a monthly basis. When it comes time to working with your year end accountant or trying to figure out what customer deposits make up that balance on your balance sheet, it's going to be very easy to determine that. And we suggest that maybe you create a custom report as well. Run your balance sheet, open the customer de deposits liability account, and start to do some additional customization and filtering. First, we change the date range to all, group by customer, we filter for uh, any status that means uncleared, which means that it hasn't already been caught on a previous reconciliation. And don't forget to change the report title so it's more meaningful for you. So that was a great question from Peter. Taking extra care to manage your customer deposits is the right step in managing your cash flow. So now let's move on and meet Alice Bunch. Remember that Alice recently retired from working for a family with six kids and decided to launch her own house cleaning business. While managing six kids in a very busy house was challenging, Alice is finding that running her own business has its own set of challenges. Let's see what Alice is up to and if we can help solve her conundrum as well. Alice shared with us that her business is booming and she can barely keep up. She's looking to get a little bit more insight about what's working in her business and what's not. Let's tackle Alice's problem by introducing her to the concept of class tracking in QBO. And this is one of my personal favorites. 
Class tracking is only available in QuickBooks Online Plus. So again, it's an advanced feature available when you're in the highest subscription level. You have the ability to create classes as well as subclasses, and you can go up to five hierarchical levels deep. You can also add classes to products and services. So think of all the time you're gonna save later. To access classes, we need to make sure that the feature is actually activated. We start by clicking on the gear, going into our account settings, advanced, and look for the submenu called categories. Now my preference when assigning or, or turning on classes is to allow the ability to assign a class to each row in the transaction. You can also choose an um, um, option to remind the user if they forget to assign a class. Remember that classes will only affect targets or income or expense accounts, even if one class is, is um, assigned to the entire transaction. To review your class menu later, you can click on the big gear again in the top right corner, under lists, and then look for classes. Here's an example of a class list. And if you edit the class, you also have the option of making it a subclass. So give some, some thought about that structure as you're setting up these particular features. Remember I, note I re mentioned before that you can add a class when you're creating your products and services. So here's a quick screenshot to show you where you can add that class. But don't worry, it's simply just going to be the default class assigned to that product and service. When it comes time to actually creating that customer invoice, you can always override the class assigned. So in this example, we've, ass we've chosen to assign one class to each row in the transaction. And I find that to give us the most flexibility when we're creating our invoices for our customers. You do have the ability to leave the class field blank. However, if you do, this might cause you some problems in the future. They'll land in a column on your reports called not specified. So if you are actively going to be using class tracking in your bookkeeping records, we suggest that you always assign a class. If there are certain transactions that really don't fall into any of those natural classes, our recommendation is to set up a generic class called admin, general, or overhead. That way, every time you run your reports, you don't have to worry about looking at that column that says not specified. You might run into instances where the classes haven't been signed correctly or they weren't assigned at all. If you have accountant access, don't forget to click in our accountant toolbox and use the tool called reclassify. I found this to be particularly helpful if I need to tidy up the way classes were assigned to a variety of transactions. By choosing a number of transactions in the detail and clicking on the reclassify button, this window will pop up and we'll have the ability to reassign the class. So thank you to Alice for bringing this conundrum to our attention. I'm pretty sure that she'll have a much better understanding of her clients after maneuvering through this exercise and guaranteed that her business will be a greater success too. And lastly, let's check in with Ginger B House. Ginger has a very successful bakery and specializes in macaroons, which is one of my personal favorites. And I wonder what conundrum Ginger has found herself in. Well, Ginger has just discovered that the new point of sales terminal that she purchased, while it's perfect for her business, doesn't integrate with QuickBooks Online. And her question involves how to enter her daily sales. Is she going to need to enter every single customer sale into QuickBooks Online? Or can we use some of the information provided by the POS system and capture all of the critical information in QuickBooks Online? So let's take a look. Our solution here will be how best to record our sales summary. But here's a few things that we need to consider if we're going to apply this method. First, does the business owner need all of that detail of every single customer sale in QuickBooks Online? And in Ginger's case, the answer would be no. So this is gonna be a great fit for her. 
Think about your, your businesses that don't necessarily need to capture every single individual sale. We're simply just focused on accurate financial reports and the ability to manage our sales tax. So this method might be a perfect fit for Ginger. To start with, we're going to create, need to create a few items to capture the daily sales transactions. This setup involves correctly adding sales items, that's the first one, payment items, that's the second, and any other items that might be applicable for this particular type of business. Remember that these items can be set up as a single-sided service item. Let's take a look at what those screens look like. Uh, starting on the left, we look at our sales items. We would add a separate service item for each item that's going to be on that POS report. So think about the different items that you need to report on to make it easy to translate those end of day sales summaries into information that we can enter into QuickBooks Online. We would then map to the appropriate income account, choose the appropriate tax code, and remember that some different items that we sell might have different sales tax codes. Our second type that we create has to do with our payment methods. I, I prefer to have a payment method set up for each type that I accept. So that could be cash, Amex, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, e-transfer, etc. So we would map the income account then to the appropriate account. And I like to use clearing accounts. You also have the option of using undeposited funds. Cash payments could just be mapped to a petty cash account, for example. And if payments go directly into the bank on a daily basis, you could just map it to the bank account instead. Make sure when you're setting up your payment types that you choose the out of scope tax code. And this is a very, very important step to remember. So when we get to the point of filing your sales tax returns, the numbers are accurate. Some other items as provided here on the right hand side of your screen might include something like your cash over short or maybe gift certificates. Now here's a, an example of how we record one day's worth of sales. So we snag that POS report. We create one sales receipt for the day. We'll start by entering in all of the items that we've sold line by line so it matches the POS report. Don't forget to choose the appropriate tax code. Next, we make a note of all of the different payment types. So the, the lines below would then reflect each individual payment type, whether it's MasterCard or Visa or American Express. Please put those amounts in as a negative. And remember, the tax code needs to be at a scope. Technically, once you're done, recording your different items sold, as well as the payment types, your amount in the top right corner should be zero. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we have a small discrepancy. And in this case, we could post the difference to cash over short, or maybe post the difference to gift cards. And don't forget to save all of your hard work. So after you've created your first sales receipt, click on the button in the bottom right hand sorry, the bottom center of your screen called Make Recurring, and you're going to jump over to the recurring sales area of QuickBooks Online. We're gonna set up this template so you can easily use it on a daily basis. Don't forget to mark the type as being unscheduled. I prefer to change all of the rates back to zero, so then I know for sure when I use this template, I've got a blank brand new template. The next time you need to use that particular template, Click on the gear in the top right corner, find your recurring transactions menu option, and then you'll find your daily sales template ready for you to use. Click on the hyperlink, the word use, under the action column on the right hand side of your screen. I find that businesses just like Ginger's can greatly benefit from this method of tracking their daily sales. And one thing I want you to notice is that we never had to use a journal entry. Now let me leave you with three key takeaways. The first, consider upgrading to QuickBooks Online Plus so you can access some of the advanced features that we demonstrated like price rules and class tracking. Second, consider using the templates to solve some of your advanced problems instead of using journal entries. And lastly, 
Don't forget to check out the tools available in the accountant toolbox. There's some great solutions there that might solve some of the conundrums that you're facing. And don't forget, most importantly, just because curiosity killed the cat doesn't mean your mouse is broken. Don't forget to be a curious clicker. Thank you for your attention while we tackle these five client conundrums. I hope you've discovered a few new ways to tackle some of your own conundrums.